All right, guys, welcome to The Collector's Awaken, a panel focusing in and on the Disney era of Star Wars collecting. It is Force Fest 2020. It is Get Vocal. We are super excited to be here. And for those of you that do not know me, my name is Tim. I am the host of the Nerd Room Podcast. And joining me today to talk about a whole bunch of action figure collecting in the Star Wars space is my good friend, Kyle, from the Tumbling Saber. What's going on, Kyle? Glad to be here, Tim. Thanks for bringing me into this awesome panel where we get to reminisce and commiserate about our emptying wallets. Yes, it's been a uh, quite a burden since 2012, <laughs> I will say, but it's been something fun to focus in on. And guys, just before we get into some of the content today, I just want to give a big shout and a big thank you to all the organizers for Force Fest 2020. They've put a huge amount of effort into bringing this platform together in the absence of celebration, a way that we can come together as a community to celebrate Star Wars in all facets that it exists, from the comic books to the action figures to the films. It's just been a great day of watching panels and watching everyone just shed their love onto Star Wars fandom and Star Wars, something that we're all super passionate about. So big shout out to them. And I also want to acknowledge Make a Wish. This is a charity that we are supporting through Force Friday, or Force Friday, Force Fest. I should say. I've already got myself ahead into thinking about action figures here. <laughs> so make a wish. Justin has just, our admin has just dropped in the donation link. So make sure to head over there and donate just a bit or whatever you can to help support critically ill children. It's a great cause, guys. And Get Vocal will also be matching 33% of all donations made through the V coin. That's a little blue V up in the top right of your screen here. And this is just something that we love to do with these platforms is is put something put some of that money some of that collecting money if you will towards the greater good and one more thing before we do kick off here i would just be remiss if i did not mention the passing of the great chadwick bozeman the world lost a bright light yesterday and i just wanted to send our deepest condolences to his family his friends and all his fans around the world the rest in power our king all right, guys, let's let's jump into this head first, like most of us do when we're running down the aisles and just trying to figure out what we got. We're going to talk about the genesis, the evolution, and explore Star Wars collecting in the Disney era. That's around 2002 present to present, and we're going to be talking about the action figures. In this Disney era, you know, the action figure collecting was really built on the hype and the excitement of the new films with a flurry of new action figures we've got all the new figure all the new collectors coming back into the game because we're we had the galaxy far far away returning and a new line emerged in the collecting space from hasbro from star wars but also they did have a tendency to go back and honor that legacy of three and three quarter inch collecting it was a very exciting time for me in particular, and I know a lot of you guys out there as well, for Star Wars Collecting, because we had gone quite some time without a film since 2005, and this announcement reinvigorated and percolated through the collecting community as we saw the pegs reemerge in the Walmarts, the Toys R Uses, the comic book shops, just filled with new figures. It was a very, very exciting time. So we're going to explore how this came to be in some detail and also touch on some of the great figures that we did or have got in the last eight or so years. Now that we have brought along some visual aids as well, you can see in the top there that I will be sharing some of these figures because it's great when we're talking about figures to actually see what we're talking about. You can see behind me the collection a bit here, but we will be bringing those visual aids. So Kyle, my dude, let's let's talk about the pre-Disney era of action figure collecting. We can't talk about what is now maybe the modern era of action figure collecting in Star Wars without taking a look back to the foundation that was created in 78 through to 95 with everything from the original vintage figures, as we call them now, the power of the force, force to we had the prequels, the Clone Wars, and even the various saga and vintage collection figures that went back and celebrated the legacy of Star Wars pre-2012. But what did your collecting space look like before the Disney era? 
if there was a dark time for me in collecting, it was in that era. Regrettably, I, I kick myself now as a big time collector nowadays. That space, I would say from about 2008 until 2012, there are so many lines and figures in those four or five years that I don't have now. And it's really mostly connected to the Clone Wars toys and the, the characters coming out of that series, as well as the original, uh, the vintage collection stuff, the first run of it from from those early years. The stuff, and it, thankfully a lot of that stuff gets is slowly being re-released now, but man, that was sort of a, an era where I, I had considered myself all, uh, definitely a huge Star Wars fan, but I'd considered myself out as far as collecting goes. And I would still buy a figure here or there. I'd like to have a little something to kind of represent each line because there was always a new line to, to drool over on the pegs. Uh, so that was really what was happening for me in that pre-Disney era. And then, of course, 2012 happens. We all go nuts. And you know, into Force Friday of 2015. And it was just all about taking that deep breath and knowing that there's no turning back, that uh, there's going to be a regular ongoing source of pain with, yes. <laughs> with, with, with this collecting, uh, scratching that plastic plastic anxiety itch yes. that uh, that we talk about so often. But it was, it was a great time. And now, like, looking back, uh, there's always these fond memories attached to the first Force Friday events. Uh, but now even going further back to that pre Disney era mm -hmm. and seeing those figures that I regrettably never picked up. And I saw them on the pegs and I was like, ah, oh, cool, man. I wish I was still collecting and just walked right on by. And so it's, it's sort of like a goal to sort of maybe fill in gaps here and there. But what about you, man? Well, it's, it's funny you say that because I, I, I have this picture too of myself going back to that pre 2012 time in between, I guess it would be about 2005. I collected the revenge of the Sith figures. I collected most of the prequel stuff and even going back into the power of the force too. That was a huge wheelhouse for me, but I found myself not collecting at all for a period of, of probably a good five or so years, maybe even longer when I was post university and I was kind of trying to figure out what I was doing with my life and stars collecting especially in the action figure space just wasn't something that i really focused in on and it's unfortunate now like you say there's so much good action figures that were dropping on the pegs there but the momentum kind of kind of died off for me and it was it was really when this 2012 era struck that i was like okay i have to go back and do all this i have to recollect some of this stuff but when you're looking at the, the prequel era was really when I had my entry point and I, I find it interesting with action figures too, is that you have an entry point into the universe in the same way that you have an entry point with the films, whether it's the original trilogy, the prequels or the sequels, everyone has their star Wars, their entry point to the universe. And I find everyone has their entry point with action figure collecting with star Wars collecting as well. And mine was really that phantom menace late power of the force two era was when I started. That was kind of my foundation. That's what built my love for Star Wars and for Star Wars collecting. It was those beefed up Luke Skywalkers and Han in the Power of the Force <laughs> 2. And it was really that red card back and that 1990 draw, 1999 drop of the Phantom Menace action figures that got me revved up for Star Wars again. And so it's funny that we've had this almost cyclical nature of collecting and it goes in these big waves where you have almost this massive onslaught, the reintroduction, the collector awakening, if you will, in us with these big mass releases and the hype building. And 99 was a big point for me. That's where I laid my collecting foundation in Star Wars. It was it was the Phantom Menace. It was Darth Maul, that action figure with the, the little electronic talk piece. It was all of that just drove so much passion into it. And then it slowly died out into that 2005, 2006 era as we came to the end of the prequels. And it was all about revisiting the legacy of Star Wars at that point. We didn't have any prospect of new films on the horizon in any capacity. And so it was about the vintage collection, the saga collections, looking back. Yes, there was the Clone Wars, but nonetheless, there wasn't this, this you know, huge hype and anticipation again. So I find this like this idealized cyclical nature of collecting is driven by film activity. So what was your entry point into Star Wars collecting? Was it the Phantom Menace? Was it the original, the vintage collection stuff? The original proper vintage? That oh, were, look, that at, were... look at that visual aid. Um, <laughs> I only have 
you know, very dim memories of collect. I, I can't even say I was collecting then. I was playing with them. I was a child when mm -hmm. I, I came to Star Wars in 84 when the movies were already long gone. And so I was picking off stuff, you know, at Zeller's was a chain here in Canada for, for, for the longest time. And I remember getting like the Emperor's Guard or Gamorrean Guard for 99 cents in, in the like the, the basically the, the giveaway bin at these stores. It was time to get rid of Star Wars, get it off the pegs. It was done. So I was really playing with toys then. But for me as a collector, it all came back 10 years later with Power of the Force 2. Mm -hmm. that was that that just lit the lamp again and it was like well if i can't have the, those vintage toys because they cost a fortune even loose i can have these and i remember stopping at walmart it, it had just come to canada as a chain and i just started snapping up every figure i could get my hands on. i still have dozens and dozens of those power power of the force two figures yeah and Love that just can oh i i they they do. I mean, we're we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of that line this year. Yeah, it's officially vintage. <laughs> it's officially vintage now for some people, right? And and they're and they've gone to antique, which is which blows my mind completely. Um, but that was really where my my uh, basis as a collector and not just as a kid playing with toys came to be, uh, and that continued unabated right through the prequels. Absolutely, right through the prequels, and. Um, you know, we, we all know the, the horror stories of Phantom Menace figures and how they were just so overproduced that you know, I, I, somewhere I believe that there's probably still warehouses of toys <laughs> sitting somewhere just gathering dust. For sure. And I, I've taken advantage of that as a, as a more modern collector too and going back and revisiting, kind of pulling on that nostalgia string and picking these up for 2 to $5 on card. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, it's, yeah, it's, yeah it's the weirdest thing to look at now and you go in there and you see somebody still selling a prequel era figure for, you know, a few bucks and it, yeah, you get that little nostalgic itch and you grab it for a couple bucks for a song oh, yeah. based on, you know, what it used to be. Uh, but that, that's where the bones of, of my collecting habit were formed was in that prequel star Wars era um, and, and power of the force too. And then, yeah, 20, like I said before, we got to 2007, you got this start of the, uh, the original trilogy collection, mm -hmm. which took on that vintage look, and then the saga collection, which kind of continued that that train, and that is really that was basically where I stopped. Yeah. Where I feel, I felt like things had come full circle. We're not getting new movies. The the, the movies are done. It's the, the toy the whole toy thing started with those old vintage stuff and came back around, and we're back at the old vintage stuff. Yeah, to me that was a natural full circle thing so i'm like that's it what else could come i'm done yeah well and I, that's did... it. I think a lot of us felt that way too right with the closing of the revenge of the sith in 2005 and the follow one year or so of collecting that happened after that it almost felt like it was a, a a nice way to end and i like your your explanation point on the whole thing saying that we've kind of come full circle starting with the vintage and ending with the vintage look of those prequel characters and never did we think that we we're going to just jump back into collecting or at least me in a big way and it almost become a, a full part of my life now like this is something that i'm known as the collector and people are always messaging me friends family hey do you need this do you want this and it's interesting because we both entered it in a similarish time frame you're a little bit before me but we both entered it as children which it was very much a child or a children or a, a you know early teen focused merchandise when you look at how it was sold to us on commercials it's star wars is made for children right and we've kind of grown through this generationally and i think star wars in itself is very much a generational film where you just kind of move with it all and like i said you all have your entry points but once we got to this point it was still being sold as primarily at least in my opinion primarily something that was for children these were toys and yes there was big collectors myself being one of them but i never treated it as a collection until i was quite a bit older and even towards that 2000 time 2005 time frame now when we skip ahead to to 2012 here and we both mentioned that we saw a lot of our collecting and a lot of our interest in that space waning somewhat as we came out of the revenge of the sith but what really spiked a lot of interest and really changed the game and i think personally changed the focus of collecting forever was when disney the house of mouse 
They purchased Star Wars for upwards of $4 billion in cash and stock and took the merchand merchandising rights with it. Now, we all know what Disney is, right? They are a promo machine. They're a merchandising machine. They can take their products and translate it directly into something much broader and much larger in that merchandising space. And this was going to be no different for Star Wars. Right out of the gate, Iger announces the purchase plus a new film coming. And that gave us the prospect here in 2012, the prospect that episode seven was coming in three years. But with that, of course, was going to come action figures. So for the first time since 2005, we had this idea, this image that the pegs were going to be filled with new figures. And what's interesting about this time frame that really strikes me and I remember the purchase and I remember thinking about, okay, cool. We're going to get a new movie. Star Wars has always been in my wheelhouse, but I never fully appreciated what Hasbro was doing in the background of all of this. You know, you've got George Lucas here he's with the house of mouse and he's the guy that started all of this, right? The guy that, that really drove the idea of merchandising and Hasbro took some cues here, which was really interesting to me looking back and all of it, you know, Hasbro has had the license, you know, they bought Kenner in 91, they've renewed a couple of times, but they're also a toy maker doing other things. And Marvel was something that they had had a license to for quite some time. And in the toy biz era, if you remember back then, they had the six inch Marvel legends, the scale of figure yep. that really was dominating the Marvel brand at that point in time. They did have three, three quarter inch, but they had moved up to this more collector scale of figure, higher articulation, much larger, they had the ability to, to do the details on it. And they, so they had been running that line since about 2002 or so. And then Hasbro picked up and ran with it in around this 2012 timeframe when the MCU was really ramping up and there's a lot of demand for that scale of figure. So this nicely aligns with that Disney purchase and Hasbro, you know, continuing and maintaining that license to produce action figures. And so not too long after and seeing the demand and the success for those Marvel legends continue through 2013, we've got Hasbro announcing that we're going to get a brand new action figure scale. We're going to be getting a six inch action figure scale for Star Wars. The first time we're seeing something of this magnitude produced at this scale and it pointed at the collector. And so the Force Awakens was, was gonna be the point at which they were driving towards, but they took two years, 2013 to 2015 to build this Black Series brand, to hype it up to that fever pitch level that we got to by 2015. Now, Kyle, this is, like I said, we came into this as children. We came to this as something that Hasbro and Star Wars had focused in on children. But for the first time, they're taking cues from other lines they had in Hasbro, and they're pointing a line directly at the collector at the generational collector too, you know, coming into this space, this is when we had a lot of collectors getting to the point where they had you know, expendable salaries, expendable cash to spend on collecting in a big way. The six inch line, although slightly more expensive, offered a, a brand new scale and perspective for Star Wars collectors. Like, do you remember when 2013 or so rolled around the introduction of the new scale and seeing these on the pegs? And what did that do for you as a collector? I turned my nose up to this. <laughs> Absolutely. I, as someone who was a, as bred as a three and three quarter collector, I remember going into a Toys R Us and seeing these $24.99 price point <laughs> figures. And I looked at them and I was like, no, you're not going to get me. No way. I'm not doing this. And I, but I'd always go and take another look and go, man, those, they're actually pretty nice. But no. And so I always just walked away. They never got me with this. It didn't happen for this 2013 to 2015 line. Didn't happen. Didn't buy a single one of these things. It never really was anything I thought about. It, I saw them. Great. Move on. But I, just to go back on something you said about you know movies and, and licensing. That's where it's at for companies like Disney. It's all well and good for them to go and finance a movie and then gross one, two, three billion dollars in the case of an end game. That's that being an exceptional case, but generally speaking, a, a blockbuster billion dollar movie, that's all well and good, but it's in the licensing. 
the merchandise mm. that moved the needle for the shareholders. And I remember ex an example of, uh, I think Frozen, a movie that grossed 1.4 billion, a massive hit in its own right, but it had some, it had grossed about $11 billion in, in licensing fees and merchandising. That's where the money is for these guys. That's what makes shareholders for Disney excited when they hear about a new movie coming. It's not that they're gonna, you know, great, you're gonna have movie revenue, but it's also gonna be two, three, four, five times fold in revenue in, in merchandising. That's where it's at. But yeah, to go back to the Black Series, I remember, I think one of the first things I ever saw was Luke and the Wampa set, I think. It, I don't know if, I, or maybe it was Han with the Tauntaun. It was something, it was very Hoth related. And I just remember standing there staring at it going, it, this might be the place where they get me. Oh boy. Uh, but I never, I that. didn't do it. Yeah. And I just, I didn't do it. I backed away and it wasn't until uh, 2015 where I still turned my nose up to the line, still stuck sticking hard with, you know, the, the old three and three quarter stuff. That was my bread and butter. I wasn't going to move away from that. It was more accessible, plentiful, uh, easier to digest a, a, as a price point. I can get three of these for one of those. And it was just, that was where my mind was at. So I let it all slide until uh, into, geez, at some point I caved. It was after Force Awakens came out and people just chipping away. And you know, I see Black Series here and Black Series there. Finally, one day just decided, you know what? I like this Phasma figure. She's a great looking Black Series figure. Feel this box. It's heavy. It feels like a big beefy figure. And it is. Uh, so this is it. I'm going to buy one. <laughs> well, yeah right <laughs> we've yeah. all said that at some point right especially with this black series stuff because it's it's interesting that you say that and you have that perspective because i'm almost on the opposite end of the spectrum and you go back to some of the early press releases with the black series you know daryl depreece he's a vp of global brand manager at uh, management at hasbro and he really saw this and put this out there that this was a transition line this was to take those old three and three quarter inch collectors and move them into the collector focused space where they were now buying these action figures at a different scale and this was very collector focused this was taking you know those childhood memories and translating them directly into a collector brand yeah like, thought, how, like how many times can they do that right like how many times can they shake us upside down for a three and three quarter vintage looking haunt but what well, they can do is build it up to a six inch, six inch scale. Exactly. And it was 35 years or so at that point in time that they had been doing three, three quarter inch. Like this was the bread and butter of Kenner, of Hasbro, of Star Wars. This was at the heart of collecting was the three and three quarter inch. And so I think there was a lot of people that looked at this line initially and thought to themselves, you know, it, this isn't for me. This is for someone else because you had that nostalgia and that tie to the three and three quarter inch where I, when I looked at this, I said, okay, this looks pretty cool. I'm, I'm loving this, this new scale, this new design, this new focus on the collector. So I'm in, I'm all in. And fortunately, and I set these up behind me this morning, the, the black series, the orange cards are really difficult to get because they didn't come out in mass quantities like they did with the force awakens. And this was almost kind of a trickle out effect where they slowly put these out and built the scale and built the size of the black series. But at the same time, they had transitioned their three and three quarter inch over to the black series label. If you remember that, and they had the three and three quarter inch on those black series card backs. So the whole idea of the black series consumed both the six inch and the three and three quarter inch, but it was a meant, it was meant to transition fans out. And we did, and we'll get to the three and three quarter inch, the five POA that they did with the force awakens, but this was all in a slow and steady move building into 2015, where they could take you from the three and three quarter inch to collecting and scale you up to the six inch, the collector focus collecting, which I, to me, I think it's a brilliant move at this point because the Black Series is probably the most popular action figure line in Star Wars right now. I know 3 3 quarter inch has somewhat gone away, and this kind of goes to the idea of them becoming more of a collector-focused brand, uh, which is something that we'll get into a little bit later when we talk about the 3 and 3 quarter inch in some detail. But as this line, Kyle, as this line kind of came out and you've gone back and subsequently collected some of these What's your favorite figure from the ones that are up on the screen here? This is the first, the orange card back for the most part figures with the exception of the Boba Fett Carbonite. It, that was more of a 2013 SDC exclusive, but what kind of drew your eye in this first line, even going back and collecting it sometime later? Well, actually I, I still don't own anything from this line, 
Um, but what I can tell you is that my brother, who yeah. you know very well, has <laughs> left. I have his orange back uh, Boba Fett on my shelf here. He's, you know, he left it with me for, to, for safekeeping. And that's, it's a beautiful figure. It really is. The one I really wanted at the time, I remember, uh, and just didn't do it, was the Han Solo. And I just, there was something about the way uh, the Stormtrooper utility belt and the, and the holster for his blaster just hung around his waist. It just looked so cool. It just seemed to capture the vibe, uh, the roguish vibe of Han Solo. And I just wanted that figure. Never pulled the trigger, never, never followed through. But also, oddly enough, Greedo. I really like the look of Greedo. Um, and, he's such and, a loser. He's such a dunce, but <laughs> it's, the it's, figure is great. It's an awesome figure, and it was a peg warmer. That and the Jabba, as they call it, Jabba Slayer Leia. Now, that those two were the peg warmers of that of that time, and now they're. Yeah, I think your brother, I bought it for him, paid sixty dollars for that Greedo. <laughs> right, and yeah, and especially with Leia, that you're we're rarely going to see that that style of Leia, that that iteration of Leia ever maybe not ever again no not <laughs> yet because this was yeah we're still playing with the the transition time of disney here and yeah i agree with you i don't know if we're going to see the hot slayer leia come back in any scale but i love the figure and even going to the face sculpts right this is the first time we had that blown up look at luke right and he had the removable helmet we had r2 here and the fet the fet was always a figure that stood out to me it was one that was really hard to get and because they weren't coming out and they were they can super mass quantities and they're being piecemealed across Disney stores as they transitioned into that, into Toys R Us. It, it, they were all somewhat hard to find, but the one that always stuck out to me was the mall figure. It's my favorite in this orange card back. And it was interesting because when you look at the original press release for the black series, they said, okay, it's going to be OT focused with some smattering of prequels. And one of the first figures at the gates was the mall figure. And paying homage to the prequels, which I loved. And he's one of the still one of the few with a swappable head in this Black wow. Series line. Nice. There's, I believe there's only one other, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, it's still one of the only ones with a swappable head. And so it was embracing some of that Marvel Legends where you have the hand swaps and all this. And we're seeing this really take precedence in some of the new Black Series figures where you're seeing a lot more swappable items in here and embracing that idea of customization of your action figures too, right? And this is right, self-customization exactly. given to us by Hasbro, which is a really cool thing that they've moved into in the last couple of years. And this orange card wave bled into the blue card backs, which again are, are somewhat difficult to get. But I always found it interesting too, they waited so long to put Vader on the pegs. Yeah, and that is, you know, it's funny you mentioned Vader. That is the only figure I have from either of these two waves. And I saw a guy post up in one of the Facebook collecting groups that he was selling his... And I thought I was getting a steal. I thought this guy was a dum dumb selling it for 30 bucks. Um, boom. Bought it immediately. No questions asked. That's just street price. <laughs> 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 there was no deal to be found there. It was, it, and you know, I'm happy to have it because like I said before, I like to have a little bit of representation from every mm -hmm. line just to say, here's the style of card in 2013. This is what it looked like. So I like to have everything, at least one of everything, just to say, here's what we were doing in 20 in 2008 2009 or 2013 what have you yeah i i love that and these blue card backs to me are, are still where this is almost at the end of what i would consider the like the pre-force awakens time that pre-2015 yeah where this is kind of getting out these last figures and especially the end of this and this is why some of these are so hard to get is because they were getting ready for the force awakens they're getting ready for this massive onslaught of new merchandise and a lot of these late blue card black series figures fell to the wayside because they didn't want to order them because they didn't have the force awakens take on them they wanted that new merchandise it was going to drive the collectors going to drive people into stores and this stuff wasn't doing it for them and so this is why these are so hard to find in the stores or even online and, it's, and you're moving into the scalper world because they just didn't show up because it was all about, you know, once we got to 2015, it was all about Force Friday. Like this, oh, this was man. an unbelievable time to be a Star Wars fan and to be a Star Wars collector. And namely because it was about replicating that hype that they saw in 2000 or 1999 replicating that hype for the new release of a star wars film and so they took cues from midnight madness i'm not sure you want did you go to the midnight madness in 99 
Well, thank you, uh, Quebec laws. We don't have midnight madness. Oh yes, I do. I do remember you talking uh, about this. Yeah, we live in a weird bubble here in, in, in North America. But no, our best option was to show up at the opening bell when business opens at eight o'clock on Monday morning or Friday morning. You got to be there, and I was. And let me tell you, hustling at that hour when you're supposed to be at work instead, you you move. You <laughs> yeah, really you do. do move. <laughs> and you know, I hit one store. And it, there was just this lackadaisical approach to it from retailers in my area where they weren't on the pegs ready for me at eight o'clock that first Friday. And I was, oh, what do you mean? So I, you know, find somebody, get this pallet open or leave, go to another store. So there was always that, I guess that was sort of a harbinger of, of, of things to come because collecting has not been, how should I say, uh, easy. The thrill of the hunt has been more like the stress of the hunt when it yeah. comes to looking in person at the brick and mortar locations. It's been tough, uh, but those Force Friday events are really fun. It's great to get out there. As you know, Tim, when you go out there and you've got your team and you go, all right, man, I'm going to this store and that store. I'll go to, you go to that store and that store. And you kind of coordinate with each other and you, you're calling and you're texting. You got this, you got that. All right, man, I'll get, I'll get you one of these. And you're, you're trying to help each other out while sabotaging the other nasty collectors out there where, I see that guy. He's God damn it. He's holding the thing that I want. Well, it is such, and this is where the term plastic anxiety comes from. It's a term that we use in the nerd room because I don't know if you guys have had this experience listening out there. You go into a store and this picture is, is supposed to invoke that you go into a store, you know, buddy to the left, buddy to the right is going after the same thing as you. And you know, there's limited quantities and you're in there and it's just your anxiety is through the roof, but you're just chasing a piece of plastic. You're chasing something to commemorate the moment almost. And this is what it was like for me. So this is an image I took from, this was uh, Toys R Us in Times Square, I believe on Force Friday at the midnight opening. This was one of their big launch pads for this event. They did this whole build into 24 hours before where they're releasing products and we're seeing this. This is again, building the hype for the collector for Star Wars again, taking inspiration from that 99 event and really blowing it up and amping it up to a global scale for the first time. I believe the 99 stuff, a lot of was happening maybe in the UK and the US. This was a global event. This ran around the world and really pumped up the idea that Star Wars was back. This was, I've got goosebumps talking about it. This is probably one of my most fun times as a collector because this is when I, I got to experience a ton of great times with my, my good friend Troy, co-host on the podcast here. We went in together and we spent four hours waiting in line at Toys R Us. And then we went shoulder to shoulder with everyone else in line, 100, 200 people in line to get in there and get these figures. And we've got some great stories from that, but it was about the experience of it, right? And this all goes and points towards how the collecting space has changed. It's it's about the experience. And these were amazing times. And listen, the comments here putting that you missed Force Rice, such good times. I agree. The first one was the best one. It gave us, you know, so much just anticipation for what was to come. And this coming in September, three, four months out from the film debuting and the first time we get our hands on these action figures for characters that we've only seen in trailers, it was an unbelievable time to be a collector. And I, I just absolutely love what they were able to do there. And to your point there, Kyle, even for the last one, Triple Force Friday, we literally had a map drawn out between three of us, myself, <laughs> Troy, and Carlos. We had a map drawn out and we had taken sections of the city and we were hitting Walmarts and Toys R Us in those sections. So it's like the divide and conquer type of approach. And it really worked. It was a ton of fun. And it's almost more fun experiencing it with your fellow collector. We were DMing with you guys, with Corey, with just everyone across the collecting, or at least our collecting group, and that to me is almost as fun as experiencing it together. And that's where collecting has brought a lot of us together in recent years. Yeah. Hasn't, hasn't that been the best part though? Like you're totally right. And I feel like that experience is becoming fewer and fewer between like, it's harder and harder to get that experience. You and I have talked at length many times about how 2020 is the year of the pre-order. Mm -hmm. And now, because I don't know if it's, if it's exclusive to us in Canada where we just can't get our hands on stuff easily but when stuff goes up online for pre-order, I'd rather just buy it online and make sure I get it rather than take my chances at stores. Because for me, chances are I'm not going to find it. And there's mm -hmm. still, I still look at Black Series figures that never showed up in my local area. Never, not at all. Looking at the Padme line with Mace Windu and a Battle Droid. Oh yeah, never saw Holt, that either. 
that there you go. We're, you're on the West Coast, like Western Canada. I'm way out in the East. Never saw it. Not a single time. Not a single figure. And it, and that's just one wave. It's happened with multiple waves in various formats where those figures mystically never showed up. And rather than go through that every time now, I have got a glut of, of pre-orders waiting. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, I'm going to keep getting boxes showing up on my doorstep from now until into the fall because it's just too it's just too stressful to miss out on the things that you want because you you will not even get the chance to get it and that to me is just such a shame that the experience of the community experience of collecting with your buddies with your pals it's dying yeah and it, it's difficult too the pandemic has made it a lot harder and dave sure. just threw a comment in here that he does like to do the pre-orders but head out on the hunt just to get that experience and i fully agree with that man and can fully endorse that and i think really the space that we're in right now with the distribution issues and not being able to get our hands on the figures is because hasbro did a good job these are the figures these are the first drop figures for force rider the chewbacca kylo ren the finn the stormtrooper and ray and what i loved about this was this is what kind of built that momentum that we see projected into 2020 you know you go back to the 2013 discussion we just had you weren't in but come 2015 here you are you're in now you're buying the red card backs and you're buying into the hype of the force awakens and the hype of the black series and a lot of this is translated into what i would say or what i think i witnessed is the growth of the collector because of this point in time what's going on rick and that's what that's the thing that i loved about this period is that it it transformed a lot of people that were no longer collecting and that those old collectors back into new collectors, enjoying this line, enjoying these films. And now we have over 150 Black Series figures. It's since crazy. 2000. It's insane. And it was really this, this first red card back line that started into the, the mass production and almost this widening of scope of the Black Series. We did talk about the orange and the blue card backs, and the scope wasn't huge. It was OT focused for the most part. You did see some prequel stuff in there, but nonetheless, the scope had really widened by 2015. So I got to ask here, man, coming into 2015, the red card backs in the black series, what, what was the figure of choice here for you? Was it the Chewy? I know you're a big Chewy guy. What was it that kind of pulled you into the black series? Was it just the hype around it? Um, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what it was that brought me into black series. I think it was just that the three and three quarter line, not that it had run its course, but I had dusted off that first wave. Like I have most of the uh, Force Awakens figures. I let, you know, the, the Goss Tours, the uh, PZ430, whatever, like mm -hmm. all the, the, the peg warmers, I left them aside. I have the main characters. I have the cool ones that I like. And then it was like, well, now what? Oh, look at these Black Series. And I remember Phasma, like I talked about before, need that Phasma figure. So that came home with me. Before long... FN2187, Finn in the Stormtrooper outfit, mm. that came home. And then it was Kylo Ren, that came home. And it was just, it's just that one thing, right? That one domino that falls and you know it. You know as a collector, you're not going to stop at one. And I didn't. It's like, it was like eating a Lay's chip. You just, you don't stop at one. Uh, and I, I, once I scratched that itch, it became like a bunch of $30 hits at yeah. once. <laughs> and I... I I didn't go very ex extensive with it. Like you guys crushed it. Uh, I probably have in total 30 to 40 black series figures. So I was able to just pump the brakes when needed and just say, I've got the ones I love and that's good enough. But how about you? What, what, what was the, uh, what Man. was the thing that sucked you into black series and, and then, well, I was, I was into the game pre force awakens, but this is what amped it up. Big time. And my dude, Troy, just hit the comments here. And he can attest for the hype around all of this. Not only was it Force Friday, but it was getting new figures. And it was the prevalence of them. But for me, it was this Kylo Ren figure. And, like, I still got it right here, man. This is the figure. This is the first Black Series red card back from The Force Awakens that I picked up. And I'll keep it in box. I have a separate one out of box. But 
it just means so much to me because, you know, we tell it on the podcast all the time, man. We went in there, elbow was up, shoulder to shoulder. <laughs> people that, you know, it was, it was a Shutting wild up the elbow. <laughs> it was the Wild West in Toys R Us at 12.01 midnight as we're screaming towards the aisle trying to figure all this out. And then I was all in on this line at this point especially with the, 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 the new figures. You know, we still haven't seen these characters on screen, but I love the way that they looked. And I, I've got all these red card backs up until I believe Solo is when I kind of dipped out. It was It's all about The Force Awakens, The Last Jedi. I've got all those. I've got the the throwbacks that they were doing and interspersing in there, which was really cool. Something that, that Hasbro had done is they, did, they kept consistent with these new figures, but then started giving us waves of old figures, of figures that we needed updates on, and figures that we hadn't seen in the scale before, because that's what else made it exciting. It's, we, we are now in a line where we can go back and do any figure we want. And there's a comment in here. I can't remember exactly who said it here. Uh, I believe it was Nathan about the face sculpts. So that the first face sculpt. Oh, man. Man, you look at that original Ray, and it's, it's night and day difference from the Rise of Skywalker Ray. Unbelievable difference to show the progression in just a few short years, what they're able to scale this line up to. Not only the six inch, but the likenesses have changed dramatically from 2015 to 2020. And I always like to say, I always like to say that the, the only thing that got right on the old Ray figures was her forehead. <laughs> That's it. You just got this nice little. Yeah, it's 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 a great figure for the time. I will say for the time in that scale. But when you look at what they're able to produce now, and I just shot up here, the, the Empire Strikes Back, most of the throwback figures that they've done to celebrate Empire and its 40th. This is a line that is growing exponentially, but the quality is unbelievable now. And it's hard to turn down some of these figures. I think the diff most difficult part is that there's so many of them in this line, 150. But this year alone, we must be upwards of 40 figures, if not more, based on pre-orders and celebratory figures and the actual Black Series run, all this Rebel stuff that they're doing. They've gone and expanded this line so much for the collectors that it's almost difficult now for the collectors to consume it all because it's coming so fast and furious. It really is. And, and that's a common, I don't want to say complaint because it's always good to have choices and new things coming at us. It means the, the brand is alive. It means the whole thing is, is working. You know, I'd be exactly. worried if we were only getting a couple of, uh, of figures per year, but th these just keep coming. And they're, the quality of them is astounding at this point. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. And it makes you want to replace an old Luke Skywalker or an old Ray Black series that looks nothing like Daisy Ridley with these new ones that look very much like mm -hmm. you're holding a little miniaturized version of these humans. Uh, it's, it's crazy how far it's come so quickly. And so they give you that incentive to want to drop another $30 on the, essentially the same toy, same toy, same character. Yeah. It's just wild to see how this model has worked for Hasbro. Again, focusing in on the collector, but not stagnating either. And that's something that I've loved to watch both in the Marvel Legends and in the Black Series is the quality of it. Like you said, and like Stu's saying here in the comments, is that they've continued to up their game. And now to the point where they're giving us scaled vehicles. If you go back to the toys that made us and you see the original guys talking about the original vintage figures, it was about going to that scale so they could fit the figures in ships. And so you could have scaled ships with these figures. Right. And now here we are. 40 years later, and we've got scaled ships to fit with our six inch action figures. Like it's and let me tell you, as someone who owns the, the six inch black series, uh, scaled up tie fighter, I got it too, man. It's ridiculous. I don't, I'm selling it because I can't have this in my house anymore. There's nowhere to put this thing. It's stupid. It's like the it's wings huge. are, I, I could build a home with the wall with the wings of this thing it's it's ginormous yeah but i love it though i i there's something <laughs> I about it i just love and this new snow speeder is great and so they've come so far with this line and it's become the flagship line for star wars collectors for action figure collecting in this space and i i have to say that i i personally absolutely love it i i kind of ebb and flow with what my focus is now because there's so much depth to the line but it's just absolutely wild about what you were able to get now in, in collecting. And, you know, guys, we've got about 15 minutes left. So what I want to do here, just kind of close this out, something that we, we can't really forget about 
is we've talked about the six inch line and the progression of it and what Hasbro's done and focused in on for the last seven or so years. But we can't have an action figure collecting discussion without talking about three and three quarter inch. Because yeah, it, was, it was still a very prominent line all the way through 2013 is what Hasbro was building the momentum off of. And then we came up into the 2015 space. This is where we saw the transition away from the Black Series three and three quarter inch into the five POA figures. And I've just flashed up a screen. This is my table about a year and a half ago. And I dragged out, I had a bin full of three and three quarter inch figures. I dragged them all out and I put them there and then I opened them all. I love the card art with this stuff. I love the low articulation figures, even the 5 poa I find something very endearing about them. But I decided I wanted to be an out-of-box collector. But this is something that we don't really have access to right now. The 5 poa is, is more or less gone. They've transitioned into the vintage collection, which does have a price point that I'm not as comfortable with. But the children's scale, if I can call it that... I know, you know, people might get upset about that, but this is who this is focused at from a pure business sense. That has somewhat gone away. And I always find that interesting that the bread and butter of Star Wars action figures and collecting there is is a lot smaller than it used to be, especially when you look at peg space in stores. But going back to 2015, Matt, th this was the line. Like, I love this three and three quarter inch. I was doing both. I was running, you know, <laughs> down the aisle, picking up the three and three quarter inch and the black series. And I know you've always been a three, three quarter inch guy. Did you jump into this? And do you have any comments on this evolving space of three and three quarter inch? Yeah, it's, well, it's a space that has become very jumbled and I don't fully understand the reasoning for why they did what they did. But, you know, I brought some show and tell here as well. And I remember looking at this line and this to me, take it, take the vintage collection stuff out of it. The, the old stuff from the seventies and eighties. The look of this card back to me is the nicest card back, best card art they've done in Star Wars, period. And I'll, I'll, I'll extend that out to the Rogue One line here. It's very similar in the way they made these cards, but also like the quality of this packaging was prime. Like the, 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 those of you who collected remember that th this, you know, this cardboard here was doubled up. It was mm -hmm. a, a security measure. The, you know, the lip of the blister, the bubble here was underneath the cardboard it was just so the, the refinement on this packaging was so great. And I don't know if it's, if these two lines suffered from a bit of prequelitis in that they just did too much again, because when you go over to the last Jedi and the solo line, it, you know, when you com compare size wise, you know, there's, there's, you know, one is way smaller than the other. You know, the Last Jedi and, and Solo card backs became way smaller, way flimsier. And I, I have to wonder if that is a result of them seeing sort of the three and three quarter line as a sinking ship. And so let's trim costs. Let's cut back on the packaging mm -hmm. and let's get these figures out and let's get, get out of this line. Because here we are, Rise of Skywalker, no five POA, no and three and three quarters at all. And that was a damn shame. Like there's a lot of people going, why didn't you just run out the string here? Give us these nine movies with a consistent uh, line of figures at three and three quarters. So we can do our dioramas so we can have our collections, but no, they've pulled the plug. They shift it over to like a, a, a five inch cartoony yeah, outside type. adventures. Yeah. Right. Which is nice, but it's, it's a real left turn for that, for that line. Uh, and then now we have the, like a two and a half inch line with mission fleet. Mm -hmm. So that the, the, the collectible or the toy aimed at children for the specific purpose of playing it's a real jumbled mess right now. I don't know what the thinking is with all that, but I, I, you know, I think they missed a trick by going to these new lines, new formats so soon. Well, and I think it's, it's more explicitly pointed at a child. I think the galaxy adventures in particular, and maybe the, the two inch line as well. I mean, Ryan yeah. just chucked in here. That he does like the galaxy adventures and I have to agree with you. The look of them is great. It's, it's something that isn't personally for me and I can appreciate what they're doing there, but the thing that you have to remember too is the price point. When these three and three quarters came out, they're about 10 bucks, right? Yeah. And now the vintage collection is upwards of 17, 18. But I have to agree with you. And I guess I have two ways I look at this. When I look at this from a pure collecting standpoint, I love what they're doing with the three and three quarters, especially the five POA through these movies. 
I agree with you. The card art looks great, but you can see it start to, to, to wear as they get towards Solo and The Last Jedi. And to the point where we're finding these figures in the Dollaramas for two, three bucks. That's how I finished out my Last Jedi line in three through Orange was at Dollarama. I and never, so, Tim, I, I'll stop you right there. I, I'll do you one better. I remember going to various Toys R Us locations in my area and finding Jin Urso, Cassian Andor, mm -hmm. deep on the pegs, 99 cents. I did the same thing. I bought a whole Crazy. pile of them. Never just seen that before. The line. And, but this was, I guess, an indication, I guess, both from a child focus and a collector focus that the three and three quarter inch, for whatever reason, people just weren't into them in the same way that they were like, whether it was overproduction or whether it was this focus onto the black series that pushed collectors one way or another, they had to make a decision with their wallet and they chose the black series. And I, I agree with you. It's unfortunate from the rise of Skywalker perspective that they didn't do it, but looking at business wise, I don't disagree with the decision. It, it pains me as a collector, yes. but when none of this stuff was selling, I don't blame them for pulling them out. And yeah, you got to try something different. Exactly. And they've gone a different pathway. They've, they've had this solid baseline collectors, uh, our collector focused brand and line. And now they have to figure out what to do with the legacy of the three, three quarter inch. And that's really what leads us to the vintage collection. Hasbro heard the call from the collector that we want these highly articulated or more articulated action figures. But with that comes a price. And with that comes a, you know, a, a bit more of a balancing between the different lines. You basically, and I did this, I had to pick or choose either the vintage collection or the black series. And I chose the black series and you kind of lead a bit more towards the vintage collection, right? Well, uh, uh <laughs> or a bit of both. <laughs> I, do, I, I'm definitely doing both. Um, I, I am more attracted to the vintage collection stuff. I love that card back look, uh, that mm -hmm. harkens back to the old days. I, I love it. I'm not a huge, I'm not huge for nostalgia within the, the stories of Star Wars, but when you give me the collecting end of it, hit me right in the right, right between the eyes with, with the nostalgia. I love that. Yeah. And I know that they're gouging me for a piece of card art that looks like it was made in it's 1977. So beautiful though. So beautiful. It's, it's great. It's fantastic. And um, I, I'm eventually in this blank canvas here behind me is going to be filled with vintage collection figures and it's going to look great. And I can't wait for that day. But yeah, man, like that, that price point, at the, at, on one hand, it hurts, but on the second hand, look at that slave one. You know, look look at the it's little beautiful. diorama they've set up there. It's amazing. It's great stuff. Um, so my heart is there, but I still I do love the Black Series stuff just for the fact that if if you want to avoid going to the statues, the hot toys, and dropping 150 bucks for a statue or a bust or five five hundred bucks for a full on hot toys figure. Black Series is where it's at for you, man. You get a little six-inch action, and it's just, they're they are great. The sculpts are progressively getting better and better. Um, they're really doing a good job. I mean, I wish distribution would be fixed completely because it's been so frustrating. That has been the worst part of collecting in this era by a, a long shot. But the product that is coming out is amazing. If not, you know, in some cases like Vader, a little monotonous. I don't know how many Darth Vaders they've come out with since 2015. The answer is probably too many, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> the quality is always, always there for me now. Well, and that's the thing I think, and Karen's got a, a really good point in here in the comments about the the cost and the expense and some of the size space is, is prime in some places. And it is very valuable for collectors. If you don't have the space, you don't, I, I personally never wanted to be a, a bin collector, as I call it, where you get something and, you know, you file it away. To never to be seen again. Your brother's great yeah. at this. <laughs> I'm great at this. I'm 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 great at it too. He probably learned it from me. And I, I love what Karen is saying about you know, I wish I could afford the new Millennium Falcon model. Oh, like the, the, the vintage collection Falcon it's is what dreams are made of, dude. Mm -hmm. But for six hundred bucks, it's uh, you it's, can't it, it's a nightmare. You, just, you realistically <laughs> can't do that. And and that's what's hard. That's where the balance comes. And you know, we're not I I'm personally also a Marvel collector. I've gotten in turtles recently. And so it's about finding the balance with it all. And I think to kind of wrap or get towards wrapping this conversation up, you know, we've got going back to that that line in the sand, that Disney era, as I've dubbed it here, the modern era of collecting, if you can call it. To steal the the title of the the panel, the collector really has awakened, I think, in a lot of us, and that's something that is at the heart of a lot of Star Wars fandom is collecting. Everyone's got a Funko Pop, 
a figure, a Pez, whatever. They've got something to commemorate Star Wars through collecting. And you don't have to be a big major collector like some of us. You can just have something that sits on your desk. But that in itself is something that I think drives and brings that camaraderie amongst Star Wars, even beyond the films. And it's just something that is just... I will never give up because of my love and passion for Star Wars, but also for doing this and enjoying this and sharing it with people. So my last question to you, Kyle, is do you think Star Wars has shifted from a, at least in the collecting space, have they shifted away from promoting more towards the younger generation and really shifted the focus over to the collector? I think that's un without a doubt. Um, mm -hmm. I can't speak for anybody, everybody in every, all parts of the world, but I know that I used to look in my local flyers weekly, Toys R Us, uh, Walmart, and without, I would always find a little section for Star Wars if they were having a sale. They're never there anymore. And it's, I, I, to me, that's a signal that, okay, it's not a priority anymore. Kids aren't buying this stuff the way they used to. Let's focus on the adults. And, you know, when you look at the prevalence of like the indie toy shops that are, popping up everywhere now like a lot of guys are making little small businesses by selling black series mm -hmm. by selling NECA, the turtle lines they know where the collectors are at now it's been really refined down to a science people know where to go and we're as collectors our our desires are the bar the bar is constantly going up yeah Right. So we, there, there's very, we, we have no tolerance for, for a poor product. No. And we, and we have the platforms to, to tell them that as well, which is, has been great. The interaction with Hasbro recently with their fan first Fridays and them taking the feedback, re-releasing the archive line, which is something we didn't really touch on, but allowed collectors to go back to those early 2013 to 15 figures that weren't in the mindset or the mind frame or even available for those collectors. But it's been great that they've been able to go back and not pay scalper prices. You know, we've got Hasbro Pulse. So the interaction is almost daily and it's one-to-one. -one. And so I agree with you in that statement that this is a collector-focused brand. And it's something that me personally, I love because it's shooting right at us. The generational, the next generation of collectors is coming up in our children. But right now, Hasbro in Star Wars action figure wise is pointing at us and I'm going to take it. I'm going to run with it because I, I love it, man. I love this space and I loved talking Star Wars with you, man. I love talking to action figures and collecting. It's something that we're constantly DMing back and forth. We're chatting about online. We're drooling over the next releases. And so, man, I really appreciate you coming on here, jumping into the panel and talking through Star Wars with me. It's, it's been an absolute blast getting at the mics man. here. Force as Fest always. 2020. Yeah. As always, this is great. And I can't believe an hour has come and gone so quickly. It's Again, <laughs> it happens every damn time we do this thing. It's like, we're done. Boom. We got to go. Yeah. But yeah, here we are, man. And guys out there, don't forget, please go hit that make a wish button and, yes. and help these critically ill kids. It was, we were all supposed to be basking in the, you know, the, the glow of celebration. Take some of those dollars, throw it at the kids instead. Anything helps. Yeah, one black series. Just knock it off there and, and head it over to, to make a wish. It's uh it's it's a great cause that they're supporting and we're supporting here with Force Fest. And uh I'm looking forward to to the next time we can do this, man. This has been absolutely just phenomenal for the Star Wars fan and for the community here. And I've had a blast doing this. So just before we sign off here, man, Kyle, let everyone know where they can find you and all of your creative work. Well, as it says right here, Kyle at Tumbling Saber. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, our closed Facebook group. Come check it out. Uh, everybody is cordially invited to hang out and, and post Star Wars nonsense and have a good time. Uh, and we are part of the Star Wars Commonwealth, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. So you can go to StarWarsCommonwealth.com or the Facebook page and check out all of the Star Wars Commonwealth podcasts. There's quite a few of us there and quite a few of us taking part in this event today. And we're always, always musing about Star Wars and what's going on and from a lot of niche and different perspectives, which makes it kind of a very diverse community of opinions and voices talking about Star Wars every single week. So guys, with this and as I close this out, my name is Tim. You can find me at 
the Nerdorum on Twitter and Instagram, and you can find everything that me and my co-host do over the nerdroom.net. We really appreciate your time. Jumping into the comments here, we're going to stick around just maybe for a few minutes and, and just talk about collecting. We can open this up a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's been fantastic. Make a wish for us. Thank you again to all the organizers and everyone taking part in this. This has been a massive success for the community and a massive success for make a wish. So thank you guys very much for participating here. May the force fest be with you. Thanks everybody.